Hello, welcome to the Walker Art Center. My name is Julia Anderson and I work in the Education and Public Programs Department here at the Walker. Thank you so much for coming to Hippie Localism, part of our dynamic programming relating to our new exhibit, Hippie Modernism. When we were planning the programming for this exhibit last winter, we wanted to illuminate the rich history of the counterculture in the Twin Cities during the 60s and 70s. Thank you so much to our photographers whose work is in the slideshow, uh, Cheryl Walsh Belleville, um, uh, Eve McLeish, and, and Eric Monrad. Um, unfortunately, Irv Williams is unable to join us tonight. Uh, Leola Johnson is not here yet, but we're hoping she can make it. And uh, as you can see, we're very busy here tonight, and we'd love that everyone could see the stage. So please do what you can to ensure that the people around you can see. Um, thank you for your patience. We did not anticipate this big of a crowd. Um, OK, I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker, Ellen Kennedy Mitchell. Wow, <laughs> thank you for coming. Uh, before we cast a backwards glance tonight, I'd like to recognize the generations before us, the first peoples to live in this region, and here's to seven and more generations to come. Before I talk about my own experience, I want to read two statements from the photographers because they also had wonderful things to say. These are short. Eric Monrad, who moved to California and joined the Alice Waters world, uh, uh, wrote this. Collectives and communes, hippies and communists in Minneapolis circa 1971. Nixon was president. The Vietnam War raged, and many of us thought the revolution was just around the corner. As a 16-year-old orphan, I moved from California to Minneapolis to live with my brother, the sixth place I'd lived in four years in five different states. Our apartment in the hippie West Bank neighborhood was directly above the stage of a new coffee house with good food and live music six nights a week. <clears throat> It was my second family for many years. Clothes were free at the free store. Yeah. Healthcare was free at the people's clinic. Yeah. Food co-ops fed the various neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. There were always posters to draw and photos to shoot with my 35 millimeter Miranda. Yeah. Eric did a, quite a few of the posters you'll see in the slideshow as well. <clears throat> the struggle was taken for granted. The question was, wholesale overthrow of the system or just living one's life right? In hindsight, we must come to terms with the fact that the former didn't work, but the latter just might have a chance. When I moved to California in 1976 to join a Marxist food co-op trucking collective, <laughs> I carried two suitcases, one with clothes, the other with the ephemera of previous years and lots of negative sheets. I thought the documentation was worth preserving in case we woke up one morning and realized it was all a dream. Okay, and this is from Cheryl Walsh Belleville, who is here with us tonight and who really helped with the photographs throughout our whole evening. We're really indebted to her for capturing so much of that life on the West Bank. Cheryl says, I don't know how a person could help but take photos of everything that was going on in those days. It was all so visual and we were so proud of how different we were, freer and more creative in our lifestyles than other generations. Practical skills were raised to the level of fine art in gardens and stonework and quilts. We costumed ourselves in unusual clothing and posed for the camera. How not to record it all? Visual interest, audacious behavior made the photos so easy. 
The material was right there. All I had to do was frame it and click it. Years before Instagram. <laughs> All right, hippie localism. I call this blessed unrest on the West Bank. Before we cast, uh, I, we used to refer to the new Riverside Cafe as the biomagnetic center of the universe. <laughs> Even using that bold phrase on some of the posters we designed to spread the word about the live music on stage nearly every night. We were moths to the light bulb of the cafe. The original vision of Father Bill Tesca determined to heal some of the wounds of the world. Thanks to its spectacular location on the corner of Cedar and Riverside, just down the street from Saverin's bookstore, a short hike up to the Seven Corners and the Washington Avenue Bridge to Dinky Town, 60s haunts of Bob Zimmerman, next door to the mysterious, analogous universe of the Cafe Extempore. Yeah, keep that one there for a sec. Um, <laughs> Adjacent to the Triangle Bar, the Viking, the 400, down the street from the Mixed Blood Theater, a long block away from Dania Hall and the Nancy Hauser Dance Studio, the Riv was under the shadow of the first phase of Cedar Square West. Modernist high rises of the developers Gloria Siegel and Keith Heller with architect Ralph Rapson. These were days before human-centered design, or at least before it had reached Minneapolis. Instead of consulting the people who lived in the neighborhood, exploring what was important to them, the idea was to impose a town within a town, a supposedly utopian mixed-income community living in Mondrian paneled high-rises made out of concrete. The developers did not see it coming. I would argue now that they may not in fact have been the worst developers in the world. At least they had faces, names, and a kind of naive idealism of another kind, unlike those invisible entities that clear people from neighborhoods today building gentrified condos. Yeah. We could fight them. We had a tagline, we never sleep, and a logo a black sabotage cat, not him, but <laughs> uh, it's coming right up, and the will to resist the destruction of what was already a vibrant, extraordinary neighborhood, still holding in its landscape echoes of Snooze Boulevard, as Maury Bernstein reminded us, accordion in hand, entry point for immigrants, close to Augsburg campus, where Jane Fonda spoke against the war in Vietnam the same night that residents raged against the demolition of their territory with a sound system of horns on the roof of the cafe, something Steve R. Helger constructed, and a rent strike at the ready. The biomagnetic pull to our collectively run vegetarian cafe was intense and compelling enough to lure me away from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design, which I also loved, to try my hand at drawing and writing and living with the characters, the cafe habitués, we called them, who hung out at the Riv. The old Riv at 1900 Riverside was short-lived. The Catherine and Charles apartments above it offered balconies open to the su summer night populated by bands of brothers, the Monrad brothers from South Dakota, the Pezzo brothers from a small Finnish town, Zach and Timmy Zanuski, Rod and Johnny Belleville, friendly guys wielding pens, violins, and sheetrock, helping slap up the walls on the stage of the cafe, cigarettes dangling from their lips, beers in hand at the end of the day. The new Riverside Cafe was eventually built at 329 Cedar. Somehow it all came up out of nowhere, out of the now here of the heady camaraderie we created so casually on the basis of love, peace, and happiness 
that Chamber Brothers anthem call. Today we would call it entrepreneurship, or maybe a better word, intrapreneurship. We were ingenious and persevering despite our lack of capital or business know-how. We were bricklers, not engineers, improvisers, piecing our DIY aesthetic together out of scraps and ephemera. Someone found old barn wood out in Wisconsin for the cafe walls, and then a farm near Boyceville. The neighborhood radiated out into the countryside across state lines to makeshift communes where visitors, Gypsy and Joaquin, could camp their wagon truck, the original hybrid vehicle, and you'll see it in a picture by Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> Gracie and Ralph swept into the cacophony of Soupy Schindler, of fiddle tunes, car repair, amateur gardening, makeshift meals. We prided ourselves on a self, building a self-sufficient economy, one with a durable goods store, people's pants, luthiers, and bike repair. Books like Let's Eat Right to Get Fit by Adele Davis and Get Your Health Together by Joan Wiener inspired the passion for natural foods. We scorned the tiny packages in health food stores. We wanted our food basics in bulk, buying carob from a barrel behind an Indian print curtain at the back of Peter Dodge's Global Village. <laughs> Remember that? You are what you eat, right? As an early member of the Cafe Collective, I learned how to bake bread from Jimmy Crab and worked early morning shifts with Gracie Schwartz, Ruth Ann Torstenson, and Janet Donicht. During the early days of the cafe, we made all of our own bread. The People's Pantry, the Seedling Co-op, in what is an amazing 40-year history, was the brainchild of Susan Schroyer and her sisters, first located on Diane and Alan Oderman's back porch next to the home of Red Nelson, notorious rent party legend. The pantry eventually moved to the People's Center and long story short, later became North Country Co-op. A history can be found about that on Facebook, by the way. Suddenly there were co-ops on many corners, including the resilient Seward C-O-O-O-P, not yet incorporated, hence the third O, in the Seward neighborhood, a suburb walking distance from the West Bank where hippies went to restore houses, have kids, and go back to college. <laughs> the co-op wars were still in the future, documented since in the Storefront Revolution by Craig Cox, Inside Out by Alexandra Stein, and Growing with Purpose, 40 Years of Seward Community Co-op by Carrie Cornell and Pat Cumby. What was that all about? A cartoon in the Star Tribune by Craig McIntosh summed it up succinctly and sardonically. A policeman enters the People's Gastric Co-op to say, okay, we have a call that the Socialist Whole Wheat Workers Party has seized the Fiber Diet Health Co-op, <laughs> whose members split with the Organic Earth Food Storehouse over their alliance with the fatty tissue Trotskyites. <laughs> with hindsight, we can laugh, but at the time, the conflict was very painful. Fast forward to the remarkable evolution of the Twin Cities and national food co-ops today. The lessons learned, the jobs created, lives sustained, the farm to fork to table of simple meals and real food. I wrote organic music, authentic food on the RIV posters I designed, and those instincts were a personal lifeline. The latest phenomenal Twin Cities food co-op achievements, the Lakewinds Richfield store, the Wedge Table, the Seward Co-op Creamery, Mississippi Market's 7th Street location, 
Seward Co-op Friendship Store, and the expansion project of the East Side Co-op, and more. <laughs> Which one? Worth Co-op. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. Dropping out involved a lot of dropping in, in the alley behind the cafe, over meals, at the Far Hundred Bar. This was all, of course, before cell phones and social media. I remember the day Johnny Belleville announced that someday we would all have computers in our homes and our minds were blown. <laughs> From the counterculture to our over-the-counter makeshift economies, all of it widened the biomagnetic circle. May the circle be unbroken. One of those ubiquitous bluegrass tunes. But the circle was already broken. I see it now as a spiral, an ever-deepening, open-ended pattern with adventures, disasters, achievements, and struggles generating stories and endless supply. A spiral in which tonight is another rhyme in time, a moment to reminisce together. Let the memories begin and the stories, the passion, politics, and determination to create an enduring progressive community continue. Yeah. Hello again, uh, I see that it's very crowded back there, so I want to invite you to move up to the front. There's room for maybe 15 more people up here. There's a seat right there, one seat. Um, comes in the aisles, you don't have to stand back there. So, come on up. I want to thank Julia um, for uh, this young woman who just moved to Minnesota and managed to get this thing together. Um, I, I'm very impressed. <laughs> she wasn't here. She wasn't even born. She didn't, never lived here, and she did this. So congratulations, Julia. So there you have it. I'm going to talk about music. And um, yeah. I, my name's Eve McLeish, and so nice to see uh, all my friends here from way back and present here. Um, oh yeah, the year was 1970 when I arrived on the West Bank. At 19th and Riverside, as Ellen said, a corner cafe had opened in the Catherine Apartments building next to Belleville and Hoffman Guitars. I was in high school in Dinkytown, and after classes and on weekends, I'd hang around the cafe and get to know its collective, a highly creative group of bohemians, good cooks, misfits, farm boys, and opening the first vegetarian coffee house in town. They were older than me, and I quickly adopted this new family. Before long, I had moved in upstairs with my boyfriend from school and started to work there. It was a magical place for me, especially because of the music at night. The new Riverside Cafe's first year was across from the Triangle Bar at 1900 Riverside. And I was underage at the time, and I'd sit on the fire escape of the apartment uh, upstairs from the cafe and listen to the sounds of music floating up from the bar's open door. Willie and the Bumblebees, Roy Allstad and his Mill City Blues Band, Dave and uh, Ray and Tony Glover, John Kerner, Spider, uh, Spider John Kerner, Lazy Bill Lucas, Dean Carr, Ken Schaefer, Sorry Mothers, and uh, just endless uh, sounds that were all new to me. Uh, meanwhile, across the street and downstairs at the cafe, I was hearing some of the finest traditional string band music I'd ever heard. Stephen Gamel, Craig Rubel, the Belleville Band, the Middle Spunk Creek Boys, Mary Duchesne, and more. Hanging around on that corner on summer nights, you can advance. Um, I think something happened. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Here we are at the cafe. Cafe calendar. Um, 
I got to know these musicians, and they were all probably under 30 at the time, but already in my eyes, they had this world of adventure and experience behind them, according to all the oral history that I'd already inherited from the collective. So they all had their stories. Uncompromising men and women with no day jobs, these dedicated artists seemed to be the purveyors of all the musical knowledge I needed to ingest, like going to college, so I stayed. Musicians have always been a revered and defining part of the West Bank community and in Minneapolis. They're people we felt lucky to share the planet with, so to speak, helping us express our joys, our sadness, or simply just to free our minds through their music. During the daytime, they were people you had coffee with or rice and veggies at the cafe, talked and philosophized with as neighbors, and they gave us uh, at night this beautiful music that we could always count on at cafe and all these other venues. They gave us this incredible music, musical education, the, the jug band, uh, as they honed their talents in the local venues. And for me, music was the message. Well, um, here we go. <laughs> We moved to the corner of Cedar and Riverside from 71 until closing in 97, and the New Riverside Cafe, which I was part of for the whole decade of the 70s, was from the beginning a highly creative and talented collective, that means no bosses, which uh, included musicians, singers, graphic artists, instrument builders, excellent vegetarian cooks, the bees, photographers, truck mechanics, carpenters, astrologers, children, dogs, and of course our founder, the liberation theology-minded William J. Tesca, the reverend. <laughs> the collective pushed me further into music and as part of my everyday life and encouraged my photography by providing a beautiful bohemian backdrop. Yeah, these are, I love these guys. Everything was so photographable, it was just you know, I want to take pictures all the time. I took up my mother's banjo and started lessons at the West Bank School of Music down the street, which was began by Warren Park, a pianist in 1970. Just moved off the West Bank, by the way, to St. Paul. I was roped into an all-girl jug band with an exciting group of real women musicians from the neighborhood. I was baking, that's a Michael McKenzie poster. I was baking, cooking, and later started booking the music at the cafe. A group of so inclined artists within the cafe would hand make the music calendars monthly. This group included the artists whose work you're seeing here, um, like Haps, Eric Monred, Michael McKenzie, Zachary Zanuski, Ellen Kennedy, and myself. Haps operated a darkroom and a silk screen shop in the basement of the cafe. These calendars would be printed and distributed by bicycle throughout the West Bank and university community. Here you see the huge scope of music you could see in one month there. It's great. <laughs> it's perspective. <laughs> the posters were everywhere. We distributed them on bicycles throughout the university and West Bank communities. And I noticed that only in a few of my poster archives were there in, was there a year, you know? We just lived totally in the moment and the year didn't matter, so. At the cafe, music was a vehicle and an inspiration for the collective's artists who were also stimulated by the local social and political struggles. Booking music introduced me to even more musicians in the community and the calendar was expanded to include a jazz and more experimental music. That's Eli Beach's sixth or first birthday party in Cafe's sixth. <laughs> um, started booking people like the straight ahead jazz saxophonist Ed Berger, Milo Fines, free jazz, the young improvisational guitarist John Penny, and improvisational pianist Kerry Thomas and his group Neighborhood. I dropped in one day and there they were. I love these guys. Um, this could all be heard on the same stage, same month at the New Riverside Cafe. R&B, blues, soca, calypso, folk music, string band music. Two bucks was the cover, cheap. The West Bank and its nearby venues was an exciting place to hear music almost any night of the week. The venues included the New Riverside Cafe, the Cafe Extempore next door, 
the Triangle Bar, Caboose and the Joint, later the 400 Temple, Steve Kimmel's Rainbow Gallery, the Cedar Theater, the Cedar Riverside People Center, and Danny Hall's Neighborhood Dances. The early 70s, the cafe was the center of organizing to halt a radical redevelopment plan that would destroy the West Bank as we knew it. There were frequent benefits at the cafe and the People Center. I like that, that line on the bottom. This is a HAPS poster. <laughs> We'd have the um, rent strike boogies, jailbreak boogies. The musicians were so important, and musicians were resistance needed musicians too. So they were a really important part of our community. Pop Wagner formed the June Apple Co op of string band musicians with Bob Bovey, Mary Duchesne, Charlie McGuire, Bill Hinckley, and Judy Larson, and Jerry Rowe. And that's me and my fire escape. And, um, and also started a record label called Train on the Island for musicians to put out their records. Dave and Sylvia Ray's Sweet Jane Limited label recorded its first album of local musicians, Music is Just a Bunch of Notes, in a tiny studio above the Cafe Extempore. I call it the White Album, and it's still one of my favorite discs. In 1978, the community radio uh, station KFAI, still in the West Bank today, went on the air, and many of our best musicians, like, yay. <laughs> Willie Murphy, Dakota Dave Hall, Eddie Berger, and Lazy Book, Bill Lucas had programs, and some of these shows are still on the air 37 years later. So, hold on, Marcy. I could tell stories for hours of many memorable West Bank nights of music, but I'd like to close thanking all of our musicians and remembering how a night at the cafe would end. Mopping the floors, basking in the energy left by the musicians that night and feeling like there was no better place in the world to be right there than at that moment. Does it work? Up a little bit more? There. There. All right. Peace, love, and happiness. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Not always in that order, and sometimes all at once. <laughs> I was a hippie child of the times. I'm hip, I'm hip was a phrase I walked around saying, peace, man, peace. Make love, not war. LSD, purple haze, black decks, white crosses, and joints that made sidewalks curve like this. <laughs> and I had to walk ever so carefully right in the middle so as not to fall off. I wanted to be a fashion designer. My dresses were hemmed to the ends of my fingertips. My hip hugger jeans barely covered my you know what. When I went to the county fair in 1970, I was surrounded by folks who rushed to see me. They had heard that someone was walking around in a see-through blouse, braless, and everyone who knew me assumed it was me. <laughs> While it was a beautiful time, made more beautiful by the songs, drugs, and fashion, those things also masked the pain and hardship young Native people were coming out of. Our parents had survived boarding schools. Our parents survived the beatings and sexual abuse of those schools. Um, they returned home traumatized people who in turn had children like us. They had never been parented and who more often than not used alcohol to numb the pain. It was the perfect setup for a social service system determined to destroy our way of life. In northern Minnesota on the White Earth Reservation, more than 60% of the children in the 50s and 60s were removed from their home and placed in foster homes. Others ended up in correctional facilities like Sock Center, St. Cloud, and Red Wing. I was in foster homes. About that time, I have written, years pass. If they ever make a movie of those removed years, it will be of a time warp, a deserted foreign planet lacking in breathable atmosphere. There were no dates for homecoming, junior, senior prom. 
taunts like squaw, whore, squaw, delivered interchangeably in the school lunchroom line were more effective than any inner city redlining policy. Weekends were spent with boys who were only friends. A 12 pack or a case and suicide music airwaved in from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, the final destination of the Trail of Tears. We came out of places like that, traumatized, confused, some of us broken in places that would take lifetimes to heal. We walked into the hippie revolution. We craved love, we craved escape, we needed hope and something to believe in. Like our parents before us who had run from boarding schools, those of us raised in foster homes and correctional facilities, we longed for home. We longed for something to believe in. My father insisted I attend college. I picked, I picked Moorhead State in northern Minnesota. Our small group of Native students met monthly. We heard about AIM on the news. We were politicized by the anti-war movement even though most of us had brothers serving in Nam. We were, we were politicized by the Black Power Movement. We invited AIM to Moorhead State Campus. I remember an evening when Clyde, when Clyde, Dennis, and Bill Means, and Floyd Westerman talked to the student body. For those of us who had lived through hell in foster homes and prisons, for those of us coming from reservations steeped in poverty and national neglect, AIM was HOME, spelled in all caps. Finally, we had folks willing to fight for us, to correct injustice, men and women who believed us and who believed that wrongs could end and should be righted. Those of us with hair long enough started wrapping our braids in red cloth. We took over the school administration building and demanded an American Indian Studies Department. We demanded control of our financial aid monies, some of us traveled with AIM up to Grand Forks to protest mascot, mascot names, the Fighting Sioux. I remember laughing as Clyde or Dennis talked about sculptures on the campus that were meant to depict naked Indian women. He said they don't even know what our women look like. Everyone knows Indian women don't have pink nipples. <laughs> AIM made us laugh. They gave us hope. They gave us reason to finish school and go back home to further help our people. We cheered when Floyd Westerman sang, Custer died for your sins, and we marched 30 miles for justice, equality for all, marching from St. Paul to Stillwater Prison to call attention to the large numbers of our men and women incarcerated. In 1978, I worked for Heart of the Earth Survival School prison program. Heart of the Earth was an AIM school started to give our children not only an academic education, but a cultural education as well. In the prison program, we taught GED classes to our brothers and sisters behind the walls. 1981 was the first time I traveled to New York City for a women's leadership training. The women didn't believe I was native because, either, because I wasn't wearing buckskin and feathers. <laughs> they believed we were all either dead or still riding horses on the plains. Coming home, I said to the women traveling with me, the next time I see Clyde or Dennis, I'm going to run up and kiss them. Because at least in Minnesota, thanks to the American Indian movement, folks can't help but know who we are. Free Peltier. Thanks to Ellen earlier about the Good Food Revolution. Don't have time to talk about that, but I am still the national editor for the Co-op Trade Magazine that they all read and learn from each other, so I just want you to know it's still going on. <laughs> and I can't talk about the Good Food Revolution for those who went back to the land and stayed there, like my buddy Bruce Bacon and others who are still growing the good organic food. 
So I've got six or seven anachronistic slogans. Some have already been mentioned. Uh, it all started by early to mid-60s for me, you know, 1965. I was in the process of dropping out of school. The first national uh, anti-war demonstrations happened that year. The first draft card burnings against the Vietnam War happened that year. Back then, my shoulder length hair seemed to rile some people, especially men, and made me a hippie in their eyes. Yet I thought of myself as more political. My friends and I were outraged by the U.S. war in Southeast Asia and opposed the military draft. Inspired by the civil rights movement and anti-war legacies, we built the largest organized public civil disobedience campaign in U.S. history. In my own chapter, in my own chapter, I won an important court case, then was put through the selective service or draft system again due to my continuing refusal to submit. And consequently, I joined several good friends behind bars. In prison, our hair was cut and we all wore the same dull colors. But I kept my disdain for tidy appearances and a fellow war resistor there told me that I was the only guy who knew that could still look like a hippie even in prison clothes. <laughs> Make love not war, of course. Unfortunately, war still seems to be ahead on that one. Another statement along these lines that I like even more from the Paris Revolt of May, June 68, the more I make love, the more I want to make revolution. Tune on, tune in, drop out. Most people react to the turn on part. Where are the brownies? <laughs> but I, feel more, I felt more the need to tune in. Lessons from prior generations of radical critics and rebels combined with insights from mystics and mescaline to reveal the consumerist ugliness. Do your thing. Don't just follow their thing. I was a young man increasingly radicalized as the 1960s unfolded when Professor Mulford Q. Sibley, standing there with George Crocker as Uncle Sam at one of our many, many rallies. George, another resistor, did time in Michigan where, where Bill Tilton was. Mr. Sibley wrote a then notorious free speech article for the U of M Daily, a college campus, Sibley suggested, should have a socialist club a vegetarian group, a nudist chapter, an atheist group, a homosexual rights group, and so on and so on. A, conf a conformist patriarchal culture needed shaking up, and still does. <laughs> different strokes for different folks. The hippies had it right, but again, we have a long way to go for women, people of color, and those others. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's still a weak but handy summary of the hedonistic side of living. It is otherwise incidental that many from our draft resistance and feminist movements lived in communes in the late 1960s. In my case, a large, rather well-run house with 12 to 16 residents aged 18 to 23, which lasted three or four years. But most often, sex and drugs and rock and roll were for after hours. After getting up at 6 a.m. for handing out mimeograph leaflets at the military induction center, after attending a rally or a war resistors courtroom trial, or after another day in a 50 to 60 hour week work week helping young men make tough decisions and building public support for them. Peace and love, sister, brother. For some, this casual greeting implied a courageous, risky stance. The righteousness and militancy of the civil rights movement blacks and whites together, was inspiration to many other causes that followed. Hippies and others that I knew were appalled at the racist and genocidal history they inherited, and public re war resistors came in all colors and persuasions, strands of the same generational striving for better culture and better politics. The anti-draft movement took seriously the existential call to do your thing. We opposed the government's war at the risk of prosecution and imprisonment, Years 1969 to 1971, 1971 also saw nearly 300 nonviolent invasions of draft board offices and destruction of draft files in this pre-computer era. We made the draft inoperable, reaching a quarter million draft violators, joined by a similar number of active duty military service members who went AWOL or deserted or even shot their own officers. Thanks to our local efforts, by 1970 through the end of draft calls in 1973, more than half of federal criminal cases in Minnesota were draft cases, and that was only a fraction of the resistors. 
Draft refusers were later granted amnesty, but not the military resistors. Our, our rulers, for their ongoing wars, learned to rely on unemployment and a huge military budget to supply soldiers, rather than on the more obvious coercion of the draft. Today, designers and everyone else are faced with a new world, one of limits and of decline in U.S. wealth and power. If to be a hippie was in part just another version of consumerism, it also was a prefiguration of living closer to the ground. Perhaps hippies' most valuable legacy, or one of them, was their partial turn away from consumerism. For a sustainable future, we need a new ethos. Arts and design that work not just with recognition of limits, which is a factor in any medium, but with a changed outlook about shared resources. We're eating our future, as is well known. Our situation also offers huge new opportunities. We contain multitudes. Exploring a world of constrained energy with imagination. I'm sure such designers and artists are out there. Public spaces, public visions, collective expressions, tiny houses for the homeless, pedal power transport and farm implements, homegrown murals and homegrown music, low-tech solutions, not high-tech fantasies, tools for conviviality, to borrow from Ivan Ilyich, one of the early areas, era's greatest minds. Finally, here in our wonderful land of waters, many climate refugees and war refugees will be arriving. We'll need to design cultural accommodations and physical accommodations for them also. For everyone, one more hippie message, altered to the plural. If you can't be with the ones you love, honey, love the ones you're with. Love the ones you're with. Love the ones you're with. Hi there, my name is Bill Tilton, and for better or worse, I do not have prepared remarks. And so, Julia, when I get my six minutes, you just give me that time. You gotta give it here, or I might not see it. So just pull me off the stage. Um, I'm, 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 I'm halfway into my second beer, so I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> we thought there was gonna be like 30 people here, and it'd be old home week for some of us, and then we'd tell our children what it was like. And it's just a wonderful mix you got of old folks and young folks. And I will tell you young folks that at a certain point, we were making it up as we went along. Okay? We were making it up as we went along. We believed in peace, so there was not a lot of fighting. But, 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 but just if we have any message, we, we, we believed in our heart, we believed in our soul, we believed in the goodness of the human spirit. And, and, and that was sort of what I'm making up as I go along here, the essence of hippiedom. It was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was also the revolution. It was also, what was Eldridge Cleaver saying? If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And we all believed we were part of the solution, not just because he said it, but because we knew in our hearts that's what we had to do. And, 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 and um, I get invited to these things because I did time in prison for one of those draft board raids. I got arrested trying to rip off a draft board in Alexandria, Minnesota, but I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm more proud of the fact that I went to Woodstock um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm more proud of the fact that I, that, that I was co-chairman of the New Mobilization Committee and the war in Vietnam. Dave Gutnick and I were co-chairmen of that. Um, um, the, the, he was the pacifist sort of Quaker, and I was the totally unoffensive middle-class kid from a middle family of the middle of St. Paul who got along with everybody. And we'd chair meetings that were just insane because over here there'd be the nice little Quakers and the Friendship of Criminal Conciliation and the whatever, and then over here would be the SDS and, and, and the sort of the local colonial Black Panthers and, and people would be yelling and screaming at each other and Dave and I'd just be looking at each other going, oh, next motion. I, I do remember, I, I said this to Dave as I walked in, one of my fondest memories. Of, I picked him up at, at the Colfax House, one of the first communes in the Twin Cities they had over on Colfax Avenue. There were few enough of these things that you could name them according to the street, because there's the only one on Colfax. <laughs> and it was sort of, Dave, I can't, really can't get up for this meeting. And Dave's response was, Bill, I'd really like to get up for this meeting. And so we did. We got stoned, and then we went and chaired an anti-war meeting, and it all went fine. 
I've been told by three people, three people, including a couple of old lawyers, well, you're, hipping, you're speaking at the Walker on hippie localism? Well, you, you, you gotta talk about drugs, you gotta light up a joint. And so I thought what I would do is actually light up a joint. <laughs> but then I realized if I did that, that's all anybody would talk about, and I'd get in deep shit. So. Um, so, so, so let's just pretend I did. It's a little sporty in this room anyway. You don't want any smoke and, and, and whatever. Uh, I, 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 I brought stuff with me because I thought there was going to be 30 people here. One of the things I'm proudest of, if anybody wants to come up and look at it afterwards, I have the program from Woodstock, okay? Oh. I have the program from Woodstock. I, I, I have 100 flowers. I mean, we just didn't... It wasn't just an era where we didn't have internet or whatever. We didn't even have photocopy machines. I, I remember Dave Gooden and other people, they were literally ink-drenched wretches because Mimeo machines were this horrible technology where you had a cylinder of, of ink in the middle of it and you, you had to type out these, these, these uh, uh, stencils that, that you couldn't get one letter wrong because you couldn't correct it. And the stencils were made to permit ink to go through. So if you type a letter, it would go through. And, the, and you put the stencil around this drum and hoped that it would work, hoped that the ink would leak out. This is how we communicated, except we had this most wonderful underground newspaper. Ed Feline is still Southside Pride. He's still at it. His kids are at it. He was the inspiration for this. Um, um, and so I brought some of this. Um, listen, the anti-war movement was profound for everybody. Everybody. The biggest rally, I think, in U.S. history in Washington, what was we were part of. We were proud to be part of it. We had our own local thing here. I got two minutes left. <laughs> what the hell I'm doing? I don't know what I brought. I, I, I always want to give homage to my hero, one of my heroes, uh, Dan Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers guy. I'm proud to say he has slept at my house several nights. I, I had an old mini mansion and he was at the Dan Ellsberg Street. He was the, the Snowden of his time. He, he is a hero. And, 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 and I like to say, I, I, obviously I, I look back with fondness at all this stuff. Uh, even in prison, I had fun, I have fun. Uh, but, 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 but we had fun, there, there were also times that were very profound and, and heavy because, because it wasn't just the war in Vietnam was going on, there was a war in, in the streets, Don Olson, Don Olson still is KFAI radio show. Uh, and he looks the same, <laughs> he looks the same. Um, uh, I, I wanna remember that we, we had good times, it was uh, whatever. It was Woodstock, there's, there's uh, uh, Chuck Turchik, his dad talked, he grew to half of the, the Jews in Minneapolis and, 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 and St. Louis Park. Mike Terrio's on the left, he still is a member of the active co-op movement. There's me, uh, I sing about as well as Dave Gutnick. Um, <laughs> there were also very horrible times. You know, the government had a, a campaign of murder against the Vietnamese people. The government had a campaign of murder against uh, American Indians a lot of way on, on, on Franklin Avenue. The government had a campaign of murder against the Black Panther Party. Um, they were profound and heavy times. And, and the thought of Title IX and equal opportunity for women and all these things and, and gay rights, they were just, they, they were brand new ideas. I like, I Googled tonight, I, 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 the movement. We believed we were part of a movement. We called ourselves the movement. Wikipedia defines everything in the world except it doesn't define the movement in the way that we felt. And that's a, a, an omission that some old man in the audience is gonna have to correct. There's a rock and roll band. Right? We, well, there, we believed in the movement, we believed in the revolution. We believed that, 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 that we could make a difference in the world. I actually believe we did. There's a lot of stuff to go on, you know. We, we did get fooled again. For, for eight years, the representative of my generation was George W. Bush. How horrid is that? <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I, I, it's a privilege to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, you, anybody wants to look at this stuff, come up later.
My name is Leola Johnson. <laughs> and uh, what I do now is profess at McAllister, at McAllister College. Uh, when I first uh, came in contact with the um, local hippies here, I was a graduate student at uh, the University of Minnesota. So uh, one of the things I just have to confess to up front is that I'm sort of a, a pattern recognition a, a, a person in the sense that I'm not like most of the other people who are speaking this evening and not for the reasons you might think. And, one of the, and, and the reason I'm not like uh, most of the other people who are speaking this evening is because I'm not local. Okay. <laughs> what, <laughs> well, I, it, it's interesting the way that happens, the way I hooked up with uh, local left, white left, and the local co-op movement, too. I have been a student at Ohio State University uh, in starting in 1968, and I immediately got uh, involved in um, the black nationalist movement there, the uh, ethnic studies movement there. And we, it, and it was, we were, you know, fierce nationalist. And uh, we didn't really think uh, very much of the hippies in Ohio, in, at, at Ohio State. We thought that they were self-indulgent, and uh, we thought that they were middle class. We made these sweeping generalizations about them. We referred to them um, very frequently as the revolting sons and daughters of the white middle class, which I, <laughs> which I, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was a very, very sort of prominent in the black student movement, black studies movement, in the civil rights movement uh, in Columbus, um, partly because I came out of the working class, the lower middle class, and I lived in a neighborhood called The Bottoms, which I'd be happy to talk to you about one of these days about why it is called The Bottoms. It was not a middle class neighborhood. Um, and I went to Ohio State, I was a townie, and uh, I worked uh, all through uh, my time there when I wasn't uh, demonstrating. Uh, I worked at grocery stores, I did all kinds of stuff to finance my uh, education when I was there. And uh, one of the things that uh, happened very early on is that uh, we formed a black nationalist co-op and commune called Ujamaa. And that was quite an education for me that prepared me for the experiences I had in Minnesota afterwards, mainly because we had these really uninformed 19-year-old conversations about the kinds of, you know, uh, of ideas that uh, we thought were utopian, right? So we had these fights about what constitutes private property. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons that I left the co-op is because I disagreed with many of my uh, fellow uh, co-op members, my commune members, that my towel and my toothbrush were not private property. <laughs> you know? And, and, you know, and I listened to people talk about me, call me a petty bourgeois bee, <laughs> right? <laughs> because, because I wouldn't let them use my toothbrush. Well, I'm, you know. <laughs> You know, that was just too far for me. And, and there were other things, too, that were like very educational moments for me there uh, around, you know, questions of race. Um, so I, when I left uh, uh, Columbus and moved to Minnesota um, to go to graduate school, I uh, settled on the West Bank. <laughs> I, I settled, I, I, went, I lived in uh, around the corner from the Viking Bar, right, in, the, in a basement apartment, there were more white people around me than I had ever been around in my life, in, in a living situation. People, and, and, and it was really kind of a shock to my system that people would come, if anybody knows uh, the, where the, uh, the, that apartment, um, those apartment complexes, not the Holtzman building, but the, um, the Greystones, right, right, around the corner from the Viking Bar. I had all these exciting experiences, like people would get drunk and they'd throw up on my kitchen window <laughs> or, or pee on my kitchen window <laughs> in the evening. <laughs> and then the spring of the, how many minutes? Are, I have two minutes left. <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up. 
but I remember in the spring of this year, and this raises some important questions for me still about race. It made me think deeply about race on the left and in the co-op movement and, uh, and so forth. Uh, in, in the spring of that year, I was on my way to class, and uh, a young woman at North Country Co-op ran up to me to give me a leaflet saying that they were uh, uh, trying to bring in canned food to North Country Co-op and to food that, <laughs> food that would help, she said, people like you. <laughs> you know, this young hippie woman saying to me that, because she assumed that I lived in the high rises and that I was, you know, a, a, a black working, she, it never crossed her mind that I was a graduate student. <laughs> You know, that summer I moved to St. Paul, <laughs> thinking, I, you know, this, I, I admire, I, I ate at um, all of the most important places on the West Bank. I really liked that culture, but the race uh, stuff really bothered me a lot. So I got out of there and I went to, went, lived, moved to Selby Dale, which, by the way, some of the people in my program told me when I asked them, where do black people live in the, the Twin Cities? They said, oh, we don't have any segregation in the Twin Cities. <laughs> you know? I was looking for some hair product, right? I said, where can I find hair product? He says, oh, you can't find that because we're just completely integrated. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I moved over to Selby Dale and um, there uh, discovered you know, the black community, <laughs> Rondo and so forth, but also uh, saw this, this formation that Craig Cox writes about in his book, um, Got to Know the Selby Co-op, which is one of the co-ops that we don't talk about very much anymore, but was really important. Uh, and, one, and, and I actually got to know the guy who was ahead of the Selby Co-op, a guy named Theo Smith, yeah, <laughs> who, Craig, who Craig Cox describes as a Stalinist um, in, in his book. And there was all kinds of drama in that co-op uh, that was organized around race, but also around sectarianism that we don't talk about very much uh, these days. And uh, so um, I, I uh, got to know um, Theo and the mostly white members of that co-op. The leadership was black. Most of the members of that co-op were white and were white women. And I, I looked at the kind of pathological formations that can arise in that kind of situation. And, um, you know, uh, 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 eventually uh, got to meet Theo's family and his uh, partner and uh, made very good friends with them. I don't know enough about what went on in the co-op to know whether or not the characterization of him as a Stalinist is true. I did know some Stalinists here, um, you know, but he didn't strike me as a Stalinist. Okay. They, he was too authoritarian for their taste. But but, but what's <laughs> but what's re, what's the other really interesting thing about my relationship with Theo was that eventually I went to uh, Bessemer, Alabama, which is where he was from, and met his extended family. And they really were SNCC and uh, um, uh, civil rights activists, the entire huge family of them. And so was Theo. So I don't know where this, this authoritarian Theo thing comes from. I mean, I'm willing to believe it. but. I mean, the, my main point is that there's this hidden history of race uh, around the hippie movement, around the co-op movement, that we need to talk about. Okay? I, what, one last thing I want to say before she takes the hook and drags me off the stage is that, <laughs> is that I... I also really uh, got an opportunity to think about this formation, this left formation of co-ops and communes and that kind of thing. Uh, when I read in manuscript form a book by my friend, the late uh, um, 
uh, K. Mills, that was the first biography of Fannie Lou Hamer, and began and started to realize that Fannie Lou Hamer was a pioneer of these kinds of, of, of formations, and that she was really important in setting up food co-ops in the South, that she was a founder of uh, Head Start, and that we don't uh, think about Fannie Lou Hamer as part of this formation when we, when we talk about um, the 1960s. So thank you very much. <laughs> Hi. The university area used bookstore. Major universities have always had them. They're part of the intellectual infrastructure. Like all brick and mortar stores, we are an endangered species. Important remnants of this fabric remain in Madison, Berkeley, Ann Arbor, Chicago. But for the moment, the book house in Dinkytown is the sole survivor of what was once a rich fabric of independent bookstores in Dinkytown. How many of you tonight, we talked about, a lot about the West Bank, how many of you tonight have ever lived, worked, played, or protested in Dinkytown? Yay! <laughs> like the West Bank, Dinkytown is a who's who of Minnesota counterculture. The bookstore, music, coffee house, literary, political, and street scenes were inseparable in the beat, hippie, revolutionary days. And the only thing that might possibly rival the number of students that have flowed through Dinkytown is the flow of used and new books. According to Bill Breer, Prine's was the oldest bookstore in Dinkytown. Old man Prine had worked for he Halsey Wilson, who with his roommate founded the H.W. Wilson Company in 1889 as a student working his way through the, through the U. H.W. Wilson was relocated to New York in 1911 and Prine bought the business. Prine's was the primary text and academic bookstore for decades, perched at the gateway bridge between Dinkytown and the university at 14th. Its ghost sign is still visible on Annie's parlor. It was joined by the Minnesota Co-op Bookstore and eventually superseded in time and function by the University of Minnesota Bookstore, where Breer was chief purchasing agent for trade books for almost 30 years. Bill Breer's been part of the book scene in Dinkytown since 1958. He lived above Makasha's bookstore on the corner of 5th and 14th, along with Marv Davidoff, Dave Whitaker, John Pancake, and many others, it, as Dylan's Chronicle relates. Just about everyone who was part of the scene in those days seems to have lived or hung out above somewhere or another. The 10 o'clock scholar, Dinkytown's most legendary hangout, opened a few years before Makash moved his bookstore, which was in his house, to the two-story space behind Bridgman's ice cream store. Situated between Hedden's and Makash's bookstores, with their rambling shelves of tens of thousands of books, the scholars mainlined not only music, coffee, and sandwiches, Alcohol was not allowed within the university district in those days. But ideas and books. There were late night after hour sessions and radical afternoon salons. For many, the exposure to the timeless random slurry of ideas, people, music, and books in Dinkytown was life defining, as it was for Dylan. The copy he was given of Woody Guthrie's Bound for Glory changed his life course and sent him off to Greenwich Village from Dinkytown in 61 to meet the dying Guthrie. One of the biographies heads this chapter of his life as the University of Dinkytown. Many have said this is where they got their real education. According to Breer and other sources, Makash and his bookstore were in the thick of things. Spitz's biography puts it this way. During the day, the scholar attracted an in-group of Dinkytown's self-styled heads, presided over by Melvin Makash, the scholar's resident radical. A parlor anarchist who was a good 10 years older than the rest of the crowd, Makash ran an alternative bookstore a few doors away where fellow sympathizers gathered to play cards, philosophize, and rail against the system. Makash's and Saverns on West Bank carried a rich array of alternative and radical literature. An early, if not the first, 60s styles protest in Dinkytown was the sip-in at the lunch counter at Bridgman's protesting the expansion that displaced Makash's bookstore. Anybody there? Is anybody there? A, a long line of protesters sat sipping cups of coffee, blockading all other business to Bridgman's. These great, I hope they're up here. Yes, this, these great Star Troop press photos dated 1964 feature Mike Reed from The Scholar 
who with Tony Glover and Carl Klein were the instigators of this sip-in. Dinkytown was a microcosm of what was happening, was not only a microcosm of what was happening, but a significant influence on the people, music, ideas, and social action that were transforming the nation. The Little Sandy Review was first published in Dinkytown, and the Berkeley professor who helped to draft the primary document of the free speech movement was Herb McCloskey, political science professor at the University of Minnesota for 20 years and a frequenter of Dinkytown before he went to UCLA. David Noble talks about the role that Dinkytown played for university faculty. Dinkytown is for me the place in the 60s where students and faculty came together to discern ways to break down continuing patterns of segregation, including academic segregation. The students were teaching us that popular culture, especially popular music, was an important part of life. For the students, academics should stop segregating high culture from popular culture, classical music from popular music. Soon, professors around the country were cre creating courses on popular culture with an emphasis on popular music. Dinkytown integrationists played their part well in this change. Before 1970, McCosh and the scholar had moved to the West Bank and Hedens had moved down to 8th Street and sold his bookstore to Bill Biermeyer. Meanwhile, through the early 70s, protests were flaring in Dinkytown. The neighborhood defended its small businesses, pushing out a corporate invader with a 40-day red barn occupation. The Vietnam War protests intensified at the university in Dinkytown, where in 72 crowds were gassed and protesters threw canisters back at the phalanx of blue. In this same period, Ames' struggle was transforming Native and American culture, and American culture. The Heart of the Earth Survival School was founded in Dinkytown in 1972 by Clyde Bellacourt. In 1977, Robert Kelly bought, bought the newsstand at 4th and 14th from a workers' collective that had taken it over from a student who founded it in 1974. Kelly and a friend overhauled the newsstand in one day, expanding its physical display space with 200 to 300 magazines, newspapers from all over the world, and an array of radical rags. The expansion created huge panels on either side, which Kelly had painted with a series of dramatic political murals that he said was, were astounding that they stood. As Kelly describes it, the first was two Indian worlds meeting, one a fancy dancer, another a traditional dancer, and in the circle where the two worlds meet, a portrait of Leonard Peltier with seven eagles soaring overhead. And that's how Kelly met Clyde Bellacourt and became involved in the American Indian movement. Kelly lives in California now with his partner, Monica Bauerlein, who many of you may remember from City Pages. And uh, she was just named CEO of Mother Jones. <laughs> so this, and this is the closing of Bill Biermeyer's bookstore on 8th and 4th with hundreds of volumes of Hedden's fiction collection still in the basement. Bill ran this great shop for discerning intellectuals and book lovers for over 40 years. Bravo and congratulations. What the scholar was to folk music legacy and Makasha's to the intellectual scene in Dinkytown, Marley Russo's bookstore was to the endearing legacy of Minnesota's literary scene. In a second room, floor room above the store in a space devoted to small press and little magazines, she began to host publication readings for local authors, Bly, Moore, others. She financed the original loft space through the creation of a poets club, a community that became and remains a major literary so and social force. Marley herself was the part of the original collective that published Hundred Flowers, the famed underground newspaper, um, which circulated from 1970 to 72. Two. Internationally known poets and writers like Ginsberg and Snyder also circulated through Rusoff's, furthering the connection between Dinkytown and the West Coast scene. One of the last 40th anniversary events this year was a bike tour of all its locations, which began, of course, in Dinkytown. Dinkytown Antiquarian opened in 1973 as a, as a collaboration or a collective of five booksellers, a few of whom are pictured here. It took most of the second floor of Dinkydale, the old campus inn, and functioned as a used bookstore incubator for most of the booksellers moved on over the next five years and founded their own bookstores. Robin Lynn Wozniak partnered up with Jim and Kristen Cummings, that's me, to found the bookhouse in Dinkytown. Dingman stayed on packing two floors of your old rooms at the old campus inn with books. He founded the Twin Cities Annual Antiquarian and Rare Book Fair that celebrated its 25th anniversary this year. But really the most notable of Larry's contributions from our perspective is that he published, which you can barely see here. This is Frederick Manfred's historic essay on his years in Dinkytown, um, from which his daughter Freya read at the first Dinkytown reunion last November at the Varsity. 
As a final twist of fate in 2013, the bookhouse was relocated to the old Dinkytown antiquarian space when we were evicted from our 37-year location for a student housing development in Dinkytown. We now have the whole, we now have the whole second floor. Our poetry and music section flank a big red chair in the back room in front of a window that looks directly into the famous room that Dylan occupied above the Gray's Drug Store. Please visit us there. <laughs> I want to emphasize, though, that the story of Dinky Town and its bookstores is not just nostalgia. It's part of a living history of cultural transformation, and the story is not over yet. To quote Monty Butte in his prophetic mode from a 1986 article, for the survivors of the 70s, all is not lost. The rediscovery of community, decentralization, participatory democracy, and direct action will influence the American polity for decades to come. I pass on to you what our Lakota guide looking across a small crowd of white heads declared at our recent tour of the Native American medicine gardens. You 60s people, step back up. Finish what you started. I just want to quickly um, note that Preserves this Dinky Town was established to protect and, and preserve this legacy that we all share. And um, I want to give a special shout out to Ocean Orr's uh, short on Dink Dinky Town legacy, which you can find online. And thank all of you who have and will contribute to this effort, this record, and uh, contribute your archives to the new Twin Cities Folk Archives at the University of Minnesota. Well, I don't have uh, a few notes prepared, nothing really prepared, but I'm uh, quite uh, pleased to see the, such a huge representation of the Minneapolis subculture here at uh, uh, present. Uh, of course, subculture, this kind of a gathering goes all the way back to ancient Rome when there were protests on the wall as well. But uh, I was really not part of the uh, overall uh, biography, autobiography, of many of your speakers. Uh, I was a, basically a TA in the humanities program. I uh, was about uh, a generation and a half, two generations older than most of these kids. I guess the reason I'm up here is because I made a film that uh, details the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, lifestyles of all types that you've seen up here. It's film's called The Dinky Town Uprising. It was a <clears throat> uh, but <clears throat> but uh, you can see these kids in action on the street for 40 days and 40 nights, continuous occupation, which was the uh, biggest, uh, I guess, political event of 1970, maybe, as far as I'm concerned, the biggest political manifestation, along with 72, of uh, the last half century, which was the, the crucial century in America's uh, per continuing history. But uh, the, the, uh, we were much more involved with the student movement and the politics of the time rather than the uh, turning out, dropping out, uh, the acid culture. Um, maybe more serious, because I had a lot of term papers, uh, incompletes that I had to finish. <coughs> and uh, I'd had a camera uh, with me in Ford Hall and I'd, when uh, the announcement came that there's going to be a big demonstration in Dinky Town to protest the invasion of a fast food hamburger joint that wants to build a shopping mall. Uh, I just said, oh, I'll just go down and see what was happening. And that just led to one day to the next to the next to the next for uh, the continuation of the, uh, of the uh, um, well, the, man of the uh, revolution, so-called. Uh, so the, the film itself is basically, uh, and the, the whole uh, moment is a uh, time capsule. 
none of the footage exists in, in, many, in the Twin Cities. The WCCO TV scrapped it all because they needed to make space for digital uh, formats and uh, it just, celluloid just took up more space. So really there's not much of a visual record aside from the great stills here. Um, there's been about enough suggestions of any of your needing subjects for masters or PhDs, you just take half of the, all of your protagonists here tonight and put them together, you'll have a good start for a PhD because it really begs for a story of Dinky Town. On the other hand, I've tried to send this film around the country, Seattle, Mill Valley, Toronto, uh, they all say it's too local. <laughs> so this brings back how I got started. I started the, Minio the University of Minnesota Film Society in 1962. Uh, 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 partly feeling the provinciality of being in Minneapolis. I mean, if everything's local, I guess all politics is local according to uh, um, the, the famous guy in Kennedy. But in any case, uh, the, uh, we're involved with the student movement rather than the, uh, the uh, countercultures as such. And the student movement involved being involved with SNCC, the uh, Port Huron Manifesto, the uh, uh, student SDA, student, uh, Students for Democratic Society, all of this stuff. By the time, it wasn't, see what we've got here, yeah. <laughs> Well, these were some of the, uh, the um, guys that we want to talk about the, de the decline and fall of the, uh, the, the third dinky town. Uh, the, the, these guys came in as the, well, uh, some people actually in the demonstration were yelling Sig Heil <laughs> uh, while the, um, the leader of the uh, dinky town, uh, Dave Pence, says we can't call these people pigs. They're part of the petty bourgeois like we are. But uh, in any case, uh, and, and thanks to Cheryl's great f images. The, the main thing is with the Film Society, um, we started in 62. A number of films captured uh, the mood, sort of um, condensed the mood of Dinky Town of the West Bank of the whole counterculture with films like Portrait <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, a shot from the uh, shot from the Dinky Town uprising. Uh, yeah, p films like Portrait of Jason, uh, The Titicut Follies by Fred we Frederick Wiseman, 1967. Portrait of Jason, Shirley Clark, 1967. This was the uh, the uh, c capturing the um, the, the uh, dropout character of some of the young black gay guys in New York. The, the Many of the Bell Museum always looked look forward and backward to San Francisco, the East, East Coast, West Coast, and Europe. At the same time, all of this was happening in Dinky Town, West Bank. There were the riots in Paris. You, and I, we were focused, the student movement uh, and myself at the Bell Museum, bringing in all the foreign films, uh, wanted to capture a, a worldwide uh, 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 turmoil, mainly stemming very much from students. The student riots in Paris um, brought changes in their educational system, just like many of the riots even at the university. And the, um, um, uh, not Millard, the, uh, Bill, you were the leader of that, uh, in Falwell, not Falwell, Mi uh, the, the hall, uh, the, the uh, Moral Hall, Moral Hall. Yeah, so, so I mean, we were part of a global movement also. The F Film Society tried to capture some of that global feeling, and it, I think it added, maybe not concretely, but to a whole um, feeling, uh, sort of a, a moving mist of dissatisfaction with the country as every, all the younger people in Dinky Town, and myself too, grew up expecting another set of values and a um, fulfillment of ideals going back to the FDR period that never happened. And of course, once the Reagan um, era came in, it was also the end of the counterculture. Uh, we just managed to go south instead of continuing like we should have. 
the, uh, the Maisel's brothers, the documentary films of the era, added a lot to the sensibility of the Dinky Towner uh, people all together, I feel. Um, and of course, uh, the uh, capturing of the reality of America through the new technological film apparatus added a lot to our feeling of our presence. Of course, it all ended about the time of three, four years later with Give Me Shelter, the murder, the deaths at the Altamont, uh, uh, um, sing-in in Berkeley, and that sort of put the kibosh on where this movement was going to go. Things changed quite a bit after that. Of course, I see this history uh, in the progression of film and film titles rather than <laughs> um, bands on the West Bank, and although I was part of all of this, uh, I was at a sort of a different uh, part of the university and had to worry about getting audiences at Bell Museum. But uh, there were uh, many of the p people in the, that were mentioned tonight uh, formed their cultural formation, their uh, social formation from film. We know that film is a huge catalyst in behavior changing lives, uh, being tra important moments that send us on a different path. So um, I guess I was glad I was able to see all the films that mainly brought them because I wanted to see them myself. And <laughs> the Dinky Town Uprising, I hope we'll get a chance to replay, uh, give you another sense of what the period was like. All of the themes that were mentioned tonight that you find either in uh, Haight Ashbury, even in um, New York at the time, are ca are capsulized in the Dinky Town film. So it's a great anthology of uh, the moods of the time as well. When I get come back uh, this fall or some other time, if I can find a place to show it, I hope many of you who haven't seen it will get a chance because it will bring back this era in a different and more uh, pointed way. Thank you. Thank you.